Welcome to the Art of Conscious Living. Today, my guest is Clarine McLaughlin. She wrote an incredible book, The Practical Visionary. And I'm so pleased to sit here today and speak with her and meet her for the very first time. Your book is an incredible read. It's basically combining the practical with the spiritual, the social, which is very important right now. Here in America, we have the troubled times with economics. And what I'd like to speak to you about, and welcome to the show. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Great. What I'd like to speak to you about, Chlorine, is what you feel that really a person needs to be, do in their life today to really get a hold and a sense of where they need to be to be successful mm -hmm. and to be above everything that's happening and just to keep in turn with all the events that are happening here in America. Yes, and there's so much going on right now. It's so challenging times and on so many, so many levels. And what I found that's really important is just to take some quiet time each day to get in touch with the deeper aspect of yourself, to just breathe, to take a quiet walk or a quiet few moments in, in the mornings, and just tune into your inner wisdom. Just feel a sense of connection to what your real essence is, what your, you know, your strengths, your purpose in being here. And to me, that's my inner compass that helps guide me and helps me stay on track, no matter what's happening in the outer world, because things can be so challenging today. And, and um, that's what I find is most important. Well, what is a practical visionary? Your book is absolutely amazing. It really breaks down and really empowers people when they read it? Well, what I find is for many, many years I've worked with visionaries and we've started the Center for Visionary Leadership in Washington, D.C. about 15 years ago or so. And we've talked with and drawn a lot of people who have great visions, great ideas, but are not always so good at bringing them down to earth and making them happen in the world, taking their dreams and bringing them out to be effective. So we notice that what's really needed today and the way the energy is moving, it's encouraging all of us to be more practical, to bring our dreams into the world, make them more grounded, more helpful, more realistic. And so to me, being a practical visionary is keeping your eyes on the horizon, on the big vision, the big purpose, you know, the distance, but your feet on the ground, but yet your heart on fire for a better world. And so many people want to change the world or help the world or at least help their friends or family or neighborhood be more, um, you know, loving, be more um, uh, healing, bring healing energies or help in some way. And what I'm finding that's missing is sometimes thinking through the practical steps to bring it into the world or be really appreciating the kind of in-depth analysis and practical side of being a visionary. Because it's wonderful to have these great dreams and visions, but sometimes what's needed is also being aware of connecting with people, with the earth, with life, and making a connection between your vision and life. Do you think it's possible that we could have conscious politics? Uh, <laughs> For instance, an example of that would be of Al Gore, mm -hmm. what he's doing at the moment. He's talking about the climate mm -hmm. and the possibilities of, of the danger of, of what's happening with that mm -hmm. and the need to look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, so can politics and real life work hand in hand? And can there be a mm -hmm. idea of self-realization about all of this? Yes. Well, people always want to know, like, that's the hard part, you know, everything begins in mysticism and ends in politics. And, you know, a lot of my work over the years, my previous book co-authored with my husband Gordon Davidson, was spiritual politics. So we did a whole book on how to create a more conscious politics, both being aware of anal analyzing what's going on in the world from a more spiritual perspective, from the deeper causes, the meaning of events, but also looking at what's going on in terms of good work that people are doing to create change, to resolve conflicts, to end poverty, to you know, create healing, create uh, more effective schools, and so on. 
And I have met over the years, I think, a few politicians who are more conscious, who are trying to walk the talk and live their values in a clear way. But I think what, what I've noticed is that sometimes the structures, the system, doesn't always support them to be their best self. And, you know, the climate right now in Washington is so divisive and so um, difficult to find higher common ground on any issue and look at what is the grain of truth on each side of an issue. And I, I love it when I see politicians beginning to do that in a real way, in an effective way, standing for their truth, you know, standing up, speaking truth to power, but on the other hand, when it's time to really look at, well, how can a policy be effective? Finding the common ground in it. And that, to me, has been very encouraging. I've explored that and done a lot of research on that over the years. Well, another example would be Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. and, but he was not looked at as being one of the strongest presidents. Yes. But he was very social. Mm -hmm. So well, speak on that, what you would think, that what needs to be done there. How can you combine the two together? of mm -hmm. being practical, being spiritual, and being of the politics and the economics of what needs yeah. to be to serve the people, about the people, for the people. Yes. Well, I think what's really needed is, and I've heard many politicians say this, is that it really starts with us. It starts with the people and what we demand of our leaders and who we choose and how we get engaged with issues. You know, somehow expecting somebody to have, you know, have all the answers, be totally, uh, take care of everything without our engagement, without our contribution, I think is a real challenge today. So it's an engaged citizenry. I remember there's a wonderful quote from Franklin Roosevelt where someone came in and was really trying to lobby him to take a stand on a particular issue. <clears throat> and he says, that's great. He says, go out there and make, make me do it by building public opinion to support this this approach. And I think we forget how important that is, how important you know, each of us can contribute to making a better world, to um, helping create the kind of leaders that we'd like. You know? And it isn't just about vision. So many <clears throat> can give wonderful talks, but it's also the practical everyday building relationships, being uh, smart and savvy and effective and wise in how you work with policies and when you, how you work in the political arena. I worked uh, many, some years ago for President Clinton's Council on Sustainable Development and I directed a national task force on sustainable communities. And what I found is that there were some wonderful people in government who were really trying to do good work. You know, it isn't a question of all these bad people in government trying to, you know, control us or anything. But what I noticed is that you know, as I started working in that arena is that I had to really educate myself to be effective. I had to see how I could do my job in a way that could be more um, uh, effective and more um, reach out to the public, engage people, create the kind of um, opportunities for people to give feedback and create uh, help build these policies, create them, work together. There were many ways that I worked that I had to learn and grow in that, ro in that, wor that, that role. It was quite interesting. <laughs> well, Karina, that's very encouraging that you say that there's some good people in government mm -hmm. because I think there's a pervasive feeling today that government has now sold out to big business mm -hmm. and it's all about corporate government now and it's all about the pharmaceutical and big business, mm -hmm. and big special interest groups. So mm -hmm. give us an example of, of who, not in particular names, but which mm -hmm. uh, departments are, in your opinion, that has effective government in the way of being a practical visionary. Well, it's like I, I see, I was most involved with the environmental side of things, you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the federal government level. And what I noticed, and at the time that I was really working in Washington, is that, you know, you have to find the people, find the projects, see where there's openness. Um, and yes, there's a lot of money, corporate money and other money, affecting our politics today. We need to find ways to get money out of politics more. 
But on the other hand, to be aware of that's the environment a lot of the politicians are moving in because they have to have a lot of money to run their campaigns. That's, that's where it all starts. And, you know, everybody's trying to influence everyone else. I mean, that's part of life today. And so what I've seen is that both if you're in the inside of government is to seek out those and, and a lot of the ways that we worked was to create interagency task forces. You know, that get some people in the environment or the Department of Interior or even in the Department of Commerce and work across the agencies informally to have discussions, to find common ground, to see how we could both fulfill the, the task we were assigned with, you know, what our role was, but also really serve the highest good of the people. And um, it's possible to do that if you're clever and if you're committed and if you just stay inwardly guided. I was many times kind of inwardly guided to just walk down a certain hall or go to a certain office at a particular time. And I share one story in our book with uh, Katie McGinty, who was head of the Environmental Policy Office under President Clinton. And um, I just felt very guided at one point to you know, knock on her door and um, see if I could set up an appointment to visit with her. Everybody was trying to get in to see her after she had just been appointed. All the environmentalists wanted to talk to her. And what I found is that because I just listened to my inner guidance and felt guided in that moment, when I walked in, she happened to be walking out of her office, and she said, oh, I have a little time right now. Why don't you come in? And everybody was amazed that I got in to see her to talk about my work on the health care policy task force, to talk about some of the environmental communities, the actual centers around the country that were demonstrating environmental um, you know, ways to organic gardening, solar energy, all these innovative approaches, wind energy. And because I was just following my inner sense of guidance, I was able to get in in that precise moment rather than waiting a couple months, as I probably would have had to done if, if I'd, you know, gone about it in the usual way. So that's, we follow our inner guidance, we stay tuned to the inner wisdom within us, and keep our intention clear of what you know, what our purpose is in helping the world in some way, you know. Yeah. If you were to give advice to the general population of how they can be more involved with government and having control of their life mm -hmm. and to be able to communicate with the government, mm -hmm. to be, have their voice to be heard, mm -hmm. what did you, how would you say, what would you say to do on that? Well, I think it starts with your intention. I mean, I notice that there's so many things I can be angry about, that we can all be angry about. Mm -hmm. And there's a time to really be angry and stand up to things and let your voice be heard in that way. And there's also times to really study an issue or find ways around things or find ways to collaborate with people you'd least expect to, to help. And I find that sometimes it's being alert to more effective ways to do things and not just always going for the confrontational approaches. Though there's a role for that. And in our book, we talk about um, there's four strategies for social change. And one of them is being what I call the spiritual warrior, standing up to the darkness, speaking out against all the problems and issues and so on. But there's also a role for being a reformer within the system and working with what is and finding ways to be effective in whatever institution you're in. <clears throat> There's also, I think, the way of being an innovator, innovating, creating new solutions. Many groups are showing that, you know, say with a business and solar or wind or new approaches, new um, alternative energy, showing what can be done. and demonstrating the, the, these energies, for instance. There are those who are, you know, finding whether it's anything from dealing with poverty issues or um, prison reform or whatever, restorative justice, um, you know, the micro-enterprise loans that give small loans to the poorest of poor or that develop um, bartering and exchange through these electronic exchange networks. There's many ways to innovate and be more effective in that way. So that's a third strategy. And a fourth strategy, I find, is to um, just embody 
you know, your spiritual principles, your spiritual values, your, what's important to you, your ethics. So to be um, like a mentor, to be a um, embodiment of, what, of the way you'd like the world to be. And I think for all of us, whatever our approach as an innovator, a reformer, a spiritual warrior, that we all need to work on just embodying and living the values we believe in. So what I hear you saying is essentially is to not look at the negativity of, of, of the situations. I have a feel from you that it's very much about celebration, about tapping into the positive mm -hmm. of the solutions of what can be done. Mm -hmm. And that should be a motivating factor for people mm -hmm. in itself. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to be looking at the negativity, it's going to be draining you, and there's going to be a helplessness, a feeling of that, of what is possibly all more negative is going to about to happen. So a lot of fear starts to take place. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a good question because yeah, fear is one of the things that really stops us. And what I see is we have to find the positive use of anger. You know what we're angry about. You know, if it motivates us, if it energizes us and gets us moving to find some way to address so many of the problems in the world, then it can be useful. But I also know many activists who get very, you know, burnt out and very tired and defeated and so on. And I, I like to say to them, look, let's find more effective ways to do things. Let's focus on some of the successes. Let's celebrate those successes. Let's see where there's some openings. Let's see who we can collaborate with, build coalitions to be more effective. Um, I, lo I love to tell the story. My husband was um, working with the Social Investment Forum and the Coalition for Environmentally Responsible Economies. And they were meeting with the top level of CEOs of, uh, you know, in various uh, companies, Fortune 500 companies, and negotiating because Greenpeace was out there demonstrating. They had the ships blocking harbors. There was a lot of things going on right after the Valdez oil spill in Alaska, so damaging. So these companies were now willing to negotiate with some of these, both environmentalists and those within the system who were involved with socially responsible investments, trying to get the companies to, in, to move their um, focus on more socially responsible approaches. And so what he found was there was a new openness. Some of these guys are willing to negotiate. And Gordon asked them off camera, he said, why are you, you know, willing to talk to us now? <clears throat> he said, well, he says, the real truth of the matter is my kids are coming home from school and saying, daddy, and it's usually daddy, not mommy, why are you polluting the earth, my planet? You know, and who, who wants to be a, an anti-hero, uh, a villain to their kids? Because they were getting environmental education in the schools. So what happened was this was like a coalition of activists who were out there demonstrating, like Greenpeace. It was people working within the system, getting the companies to uh, change their policies to be more environmentally sustainable. And it was teachers in the schools that were teaching environmental education. So it was all these different groups working together. That was very effective. And later, um, the head of BP, British Petroleum it was then called, wrote an article in Newsweek and said something similar, that the, their kids, his son, was really pressuring him to make changes. So you never know what work you're doing plants seeds for the future. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's take it back a little bit of talking to the ordinary person of what they can do in their mm -hmm. own life. Mm -hmm. uh, meditation, mm -hmm. visualization, mm -hmm. being more tapping into the positiveness mm -hmm. instead of looking at the doom and the gloom and the negativity, mm -hmm. which is easily robbing you of your energy. Mm -hmm. And that can propel itself and take over your whole life. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important what you say is that we all need to focus on the positive more often than we do. If you read the newspaper or watch the news, take in a little bit of it. You know, scan for the stories that you're interested in, but don't let it take over your life. You know, it's really important to also read the positive news, some of the alternative press, some of the stories on, in, on the internet 
that are examples of solutions and positive approaches. I think this is very important. And I think within our own lives is really affirming what can I do? And, you know, it just begins with your intention to want to contribute in some way, some small way, whatever it is. It's, it's uh, you know, reflecting on what your skills are, what your passion, what you love to do, what you're good at, um, what makes you happy. You know, if it makes you happy, then you're probably contributing to the world in a good way. So it's kind of uh, accessing and surveying these different things that you could do and looking for opportunities, looking for options, reflecting on how sometimes holding a negative view yourself creates, you know, getting cut off another car in traffic or a long line at the supermarket and just find when you change your thinking and you're more positive, you find that easy parking space, you know, the get you get um, a new grocery uh, line in the grocery store opens up right at the moment you're ready. Those kind of things where things go smoothly is because of our state of consciousness, what we're thinking, what we're expecting. And I think that's what each of us can do in creating a more positive world. How do you think the government is doing at this moment, the President of the United States, Obama? At this, at this moment, well, it's interesting in that I think he's very positive oriented, you know, in, in the talks that he gives and what he, he's attempting to do. It's like, it's not just a president, though. There is a Congress. There's what the people expect of him, how engaged we all are. There's many things that he's doing that I appreciate. There's things I don't agree with um, that I think he's not been as courageous about. I think he could be stronger than he is. Uh, sometimes I don't think he realizes how much strength he does have. I think it's something in him as well as maybe his experiences that, you know, the, I, would give, I would like to see him have more courage um, and more, uh, he, I think he's very good at understanding the big picture. He's a whole systems thinker. He sees realistically kind of what's doable, but he makes incremental change. And sometimes we need bold actions. And also the people need to feel that they can, are empowered and mm -hmm. that they are involved. Mm -hmm. And if you, it's teach them to fish instead of giving them fish. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the sense today is that people are being taken care of, and when they're being taken care of, they lose all of their sense of empowering themselves. They lose mm -hmm. their sense of self mm -hmm. in doing that. Yes. So it's not a society of a government that needs to take care of the people. It's the people taking care uh, and allowing the government to help and co-work with them. but. Mm -hmm. The, it has to happen within the society mm -hmm. itself. Yeah. yeah, we find that collaboration between government, business, and the nonprofit sector is the way to go. Is you know all three sectors can work together these public-private partnerships because each has something important to contribute. You know, government has its role to play in providing for those that can't take care of themselves, for regulating um, companies. You know, that people will just get too self-centered, too selfish, and, and harm our, you know, our long-term interest if not regulated. We've seen that over and over, whether harming the environment, harming the people, harming you know, our chances for a better future. On the other hand, I think uh, business is very good at uh, initiating new approaches, uh, being very innovative, very um, creative. You know, it's wonderful being here so close to Silicon Valley and seeing the Im immense creativity that the t technology sector, for instance, has done. And I, I really celebrate and appreciate and love to use a lot of the technology that's been created. So to me, um, all of that, you know, what business can do is very key. And the nonprofit sector is really important in taking care of a lot of the problems and addressing the things that neither of the other sectors will. Uh, the nonprofit sector has a lot of uh, support. A lot of companies now are partnering with nonprofits. It's called values-driven business, um, purpose-driven business. They like to collaborate with a nonprofit so that um, people will, you know, it's cause-driven marketing so that people will um, 
you know, who like a certain nonprofit or want to help the homeless or help the environment or create peace in the world will, when it's tied to a certain company and they give, actually donate a portion of their proceeds or allow their employees to, um, to volunteer for that nonprofit and give company time to do that. It's, it's a win-win for both sides, and I think that's really key. And in the Practical Visionary book, I like to give a lot of examples of solutions, things that people can do in their own lives, things that you can do in the larger world that are effective. And a lot of the groups and books and conferences and centers people can visit and get engaged in to create a better world. I call it the new world that's based on more compassion, more um, a whole systems approach to things. It's win-win, not win-lose, that finds ways to collaborate, that's based on a spirit of goodwill and community. So a lot of these values underlie the solutions, the things that are really effective in the world. Do you think the world is divided with the people who are in the fear-based and the people who are the love-based people? And I feel that what you're speaking about is very love-based. When you speak the words compassion and empathy and connection and positive. So basically, is it possible that the two can come together? Yeah. Or is it one or the other? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I think um, there are those who are really striving consciously to be more loving. There are some that are easily that way just naturally. Many of us work on how can I be more loving? You know, we really, it's part of our spiritual practice and so on. And then there's others who are just focused on how they can be more self-centered, be more successful personally, just make more money for themselves. So there, there are those who are oriented in one way or another. There's, and there's those that are so fear-based that they block their true gifts, their true contribution and so on because there's so many horrible things you can be afraid of in the media, you know, whether it's wars or whether it's, you know, health issues or whether it's economic issues or crime, you know, there are many things we can be afraid of, but if you focus on that, what happens is you get spiraled down into that reality and you tend to attract it to yourself. So I wouldn't like divide the world in that sense because I've seen, you know, good in people you'd least expect it. You know, there's a way to touch that spark of goodness in anyone. And I've also seen in, in many spiritual groups the, quote, shadow side or some of the problems, the issues that people deal with that come up even when they're trying to be good spiritual people. You know, we all are. We have to uh, work on, find practices that can help us address the subconscious aspects of ourselves. And in The Practical Visionary, I love to talk about we have three selves. We have a soul, a higher self. We have a conscious self, ego or personality. And then we have a subconscious self that's really just trying to protect us and make us safe and secure, but often has strategies to do that that are harmful to others. <laughs> and when you learn to communicate and love your subconscious, you can work with some of these negative tendencies and transform them. And I've seen that. My husband does a lot of counseling with people one-on-one, -on -one, coaching them and helping them to develop a more positive approach to their subconscious, to deal with those issues that bring up fear or anger or whatever. Do you also work with corporations? We have over the years, not yeah. so much recently. Um, my work has been more focused with the nonprofit sector and with the government sector. And, um, and yet, in some of my coaching sessions one-on-one, -on -one, People have their own companies or are entrepreneurs and are, or they're working for a company and working on bringing their spiritual values into their workplace. Um, we've been really interested in the whole spirit and business movement, how you can bring your values in just by, say, appreciating your coworkers, thanking them more often, um, finding ways to be grateful to them. I mean, it creates a different atmosphere in your company. Yeah. So essentially, it's not about chasing the money. It's about the human connection. Mm. 
exactly and i think it's like as you honor that as you honor relationships with others as you remember to be more appreciative and grateful and so on focus on the positive you'll find that also helps the bottom line it draws money to you it draws success people respond to it it's very empowering and and um, rewarding in that way too you know you can do well by doing good in the world we talk about the triple bottom line not just profit but people and planet people planet profit it's become a cliche now but it's so important it's so true yeah. I'd like to have uh, an example of some of your success stories mm -hmm. that, that you've seen throughout the, the years great in, in my own life you yes. mean particularly mm -hmm. and um, others too well, I've just seen um, some of the people that I'm involved with that I like to support their work. You know, when I talk about conflict resolution, for instance, Search for Common Ground is a group in, based in Washington, D.C. that has helped with conflict resolution in the most conflict-ridden places. They, and one of the ways they do it, for example, is creating soap operas, you know, showing people, giving people stories. Uh, in places like Burundi or places in Africa or in Asia where there's a lot of conflict, helping people see that, you know, show them a different way to react so the children learn. And I have friends who teach conflict resolution in schools, just demonstrating a different way to do things where you talk about the problem, where you find mutual benefits rather than get stuck in, I'm right, you're wrong. Um, I've seen that be very successful. I've seen for myself that I used to be a lot more angry, upset, you know, nervous, whatever. And when I got involved in more positive orientation and took time to meditate and relax and reflect, I found like even my parents <laughs> noticed the difference uh, when I come home to visit them. I find that I would draw to myself more positive experiences, more success in my life, um, just being able to accomplish things I never thought I could do. <laughs> I, um, you know, on our last book, The Practical Visionary, we had the Dalai Lama write the foreword to the book. I never would have expected that. It was just such an honor. I've, as I said, working for the pre President Clinton, you know, has been, was an incredible success in my career to be able to work at that level to get to talk with the president of the United States, the vice president, a lot of the cabinet, uh, interact with them, get to know them. Um, just finding, I was teaching at American University and able to um, share a lot of these ideas with what's, how can we create a new politics in the government, um, in the Department of Government, for instance. Um, many ways that I, and I've been working lately with uh, the interfaith movement, people with different religions, with a group called United Religions, learning to dialogue and find that I've seen with them just creating peace and creating projects that people can work on together in small groups, just through inviting people of different religions to talk together and dialogue and just understand them, you know, to see what are our differences? What are our similarities? It's, it's fascinating. So again, it's based on not looking at what is wrong, but what is possible. Mm -hmm. And from that vein, then you are really owning your own energy and everything becomes, you, you give it to other people. They have a sense that you are that and they become that. Yes. And there's a connection there. Yes, exactly. It's, absolutely beautiful yeah and I find it's just a daily practice is that you know I'm just reminded I mean simple things like smiling at someone when you're walking down the street or in the checkout line or and I keep mentioning that you know just being in the grocery store being out going about your errands and in, in town it's amazing how just simple little positive things you can say to people can make their day can really uplift them can help them in ways you never know or just, you know, with emails, sending a pot. I, I always respond to somebody, even if it's just a one line, you know, saying, oh, great, thank you, that's a good idea, or keep up the good work, or, you know, whatever. Because sometimes I've noticed that just that one little thing can help offset a difficult day or 
difficult, challenging things people experience. And by just remembering those little practices, just you know, er, random acts of kindness, as they say, can be quite effective and quite uh, transforming for people. And that's what each of us can do. If you had the uh, honor and the privilege to speak with President Obama at any point in time and take a meeting with him, what would you like to share with him and uh, advise mm. him <laughs> to really do at this moment in time to really make something very meaningful of the next four years? Mm. Good question. What came to mind when you said that was the last time I met President Clinton and there was a, the climate change treaty was being first proposed and I said to him which be, America did not sign yeah it yeah. was I said to him be a profile in courage because I knew that he liked that book by John Kennedy and Kennedy is one of his heroes so I would like to say something similar to President Obama is you know to be more courageous to you know trust your instincts about things even though it may seem like there's just no way through sometimes it's like using the what they call the bully pulpit with the presidency you know what you can uh, do from that position is more effective than people remember when they get into that position because you can just feel pulled in so many directions so that's what I would like to do and I would affirm his spirit his inner you know wisdom his his heart and ask him to lead with his heart more and and to smile more <laughs> you know because sometimes it's a little too stern the way he sees the world and I think a little more humor and detachment in a in a joyful way not just distance detachment but you know a playfulness would be more effective build better relationships with some of the people he needs to in Congress or in the federal agencies <laughs> And Ron Paul, what do you think of him? Ah, um, I've been very glad that he's spoken up about so many issues that are really key uh, in the world today. Do you and think there's a lot of truth to what he is saying? You know, I, I really would have to look at some of the things recently. I mean, I know some of the things he said that I agree with, other things I don't, because I feel there is a positive role for government. And I think... Well, well let's take the issue, Corrine, of the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. that it's a private institution and where it plays in role to the government mm -hmm. and he's basically saying that it should be not happening that's this way mm -hmm. yeah I think a lot of people think when they hear the word Federal Reserve they think it's a federal agency but it's actually a cartel of banks and the president appoints I think the the director of the Federal Reserve um, and you know one or two or three appointments I forget exactly mm -hmm. um, but it's actually, you know, um, I think controlling more of our financial reality than people realize. So I think it's, it's a really important study for people to explore more because a lot of people have not been aware of what's going on financially and what's going on with interest-based money and with debt and with, you know, with, what's going on with the banks. I think more has been revealed since all the economic issues that have been emerging in recent um, you know, in the last couple of years, particularly, and all the um, uh, corruption and manipulation and dishonesty and all of it. I mean, I'm glad that more of that is coming out, but we could use a lot more of it. We could, I think, we need to be a lot more educated about what's being done in our names. And as we saw with the mortgage crisis, you know, so many things like that and the derivatives, you know, all these fancy, incredible, um, manipulative ways of working with finance that hardly anyone can, really can follow and understand or they need more transparency, more regulation. So to me, those are really key issues. Well, I paraphrase uh, Ron Paul saying that it was a manipulation in the last four years of the derivatives, the mortgage, the mm -hmm. Wall Street, and the corporations being involved with uh, Washington. There's mm -hmm. so much, they have a heavy hand in Washington mm -hmm. right now. Yes. And he's saying there should be much less of that. In yes, His I retirement agree. speech, uh, Ron Paul was saying that he has never seen this in his 26 mm -hmm. years of yeah. being in Congress. Yeah. It's at an all-time high right now at the moment. Yeah. Yes. It's, I think things have gotten worse and worse in so many ways. 
at the same time. And what's important is to realize, to study, to bring these things out, to make things more transparent, to educate the public. On the other hand, to be aware of all the really horrible negative things happening and also to celebrate the solutions, the positive approaches. So I like to do both. I say we have two eyes for a reason, to see the negative and to see the positive. Some people want to only see the positive. Some people only want to see the negative. And I think you're a lot wiser and you're a lot more effective if you see both. Well, the key word is balance. Yeah, exactly. And, and to know what is your particular contribution, you know, to stand up to the problems or to celebrate and find the solutions and the positive ways that things are being approached today. And I'm, as, as much as I see corporations being destructive and, and ruling the world and running things, on the other hand, I see tremendous change within not only new companies, but also a lot of the major corporations that they're, you know, seeing the handwriting on the wall. And because of shareholder pressure, um, because of dysfunctions that are things within their own structure that isn't working, they're making changes. They're seeing that none of us, if we don't protect our environment, if we don't have more sustainable strategies, the world is not going to be around for our children. And I think a lot of people are realizing that. And a lot of people are realizing that when there's too big a gap between the wealthiest and the poorest, and too much uh, poverty and so on, it doesn't help them either. It doesn't help the people at the top. There are, you know, these huge gaps has been one of the problems in the world today. What happened to the uh, solar initiative in the last four years, where Germany at the moment is very successful in the last mm -hmm. two years, 60% of their energy is coming from solar. Right. Yeah. It's been very ambitious, mm -hmm. uh, such as Norway and Sweden. Mm -hmm. But what happened with yeah. this here in America? Yeah, really. It was promised that we would become non-oil dependent. Yeah. And as Ron Paul said, and, and uh, Robert uh, Kennedy Jr. Mm -hmm. is an advocate for this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of looked at and looked at as left-wing politics right now, that if we pursue this. So in your opinion, where is the solution to this mm -hmm. and what's happened? Well, we, we definitely need more energy independence, for sure. We need more sustainable energy solutions. And but is Washington embracing it at the moment? Not as fast as I think they should at all. I mean, it's really been very challenging and very slow. And yet what's happening is even China is doing more in this world, in this realm, than us. And I forget. What is China doing? Are well, they coal-based still? The, the sol solar energy, their, their government is, in, you know, and they can do it because of the way they're structured, government is investing more in solar and wind. And that's why it's been hard for some of our solar companies here because China has put so much money into solar, uh, you know, so solar energy, um, you know, sector and an alternative energy sector and wind and so on. You know, they're doing a lot more in these realms. So, so when you say it's difficult here, they have taken well, away the initiative or well, the workers I, or the... Well, what I mean is our companies here are having to compete with these very uh, cheap solar... Well, the labor in China is so cheap so they can churn these things out. There's a lot of government subsidies for this. So it's very hard to compete. Our companies here that are trying to do solar and wind and you know various sustainable energy. So am I hearing you say that they're preferring to work in China? No, 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 no. Not I'm saying our, our companies, uh, say based here in the Bay Area, for instance, companies that are mm -hmm. developing solar energy are having to compete with uh, China that their government invests so much money in their companies, they're doing so much better. So they, you know, consumers, buy Chinese goods, you know, not only the, all the things we know about now, solar energy is cheaper from China and so on because they're developing this, so many different um, businesses in this realm. Well, is there any truth to that the regulations are basically not favorable? So if somebody starts a, a solar company, that they're not going to be able to get in there because of the regulations are not in place for them to do so. I don't know if the regulations, I mean, I haven't studied any of these things in depth to be able to answer, you know, um, as intelligently on this as I'd like. But what I see is that um, the government could, our government could subsidize, could support more of these energies, these 
um, sectors, and they do. There has been some, you know, invested in what was it, the Solyndra that didn't do very well at all and lost all its money. Yes. You know, it's a gamble with new businesses. You know, some do well, so, some don't. But I think. And what happened with that project? It went bankrupt. It, you but know, why? Well, it's a good question. It probably wasn't managed very well, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just what I've seen in the papers. So, you know, companies need good management, you know, as well as getting support, you know, with these new industries so they can, you know, compete in these difficult global markets. Everything has to compete globally now, you know. It's, it's a big, it's an interconnected world, which is both good news and challenging <laughs> as well. Yeah. And what's the challenging part, that it's a global world? Well, it's like everything is so interconnected so fast, money moves, moves around the globe so fast that, you know, in, in nanoseconds, um, you know, so you can, that's why you can have these financial collapses so quickly because of the way the global casino works, you know, with money circulating so fast. The, the, another downside, I would say, is that um, we, we forget to reconnect with our local area, you know, with our local businesses, with our sense of place with our, re our bio region, you know, all of those things as well are very important. So I think it's important to keep in mind this global perspective and to f realize how interconnected we are. But on the other hand, to, you know, focus locally because that's where we can often be most effective. Yeah. Well, a good example of that would be the local regions here in the San Francisco area of uh, Fairfax, mm -hmm. they want their own economy. They want to, in a micro sense, they want to keep it within its, uh, its boundaries. Mm -hmm. And that's a very good idea. Well, to a certain extent. I mean, it can't be totally self-sufficient. I, I don't know the details of all of that, but I think it's important that local communities become more self-sufficient, but not think that they can totally cut themselves off. Not to this know, that, point of exclusive. Right. And, and be so isolated. I think there's a difference between, you know, being self-sufficient in ways that they can and being connected and interchanging, engaging with life in the ways that make more sense. So I think both are needed. Yeah. Yes. We just have a few moments left and I'd like you to uh, share it's something that's very dear to your heart, something that's very important to you, something that you're very passionate about to others. Mm -hmm. There's so many things I feel passionate about. Um, I'd like to see us focus more on creating this new world, you know, a, a new um, spiritually oriented, positive uh, approach to, the, to things that really helps us see what is my contribution to this, you know, what is my, um, my gift, my purpose, you know, what's close to my heart is protecting the beauty that we see all around us, the environment for future generations, having a, a world that is going to work more effectively for more people than it does now. It works well for a few, but not for everyone, and I think we could move in a way that creates a new world that really is more um, based on the dreams that so many people have. Like so many of us want the same things for our lives, our families, our children. We want a healthier world. We want a more, a way that we can contribute in a meaningful way. So what's close to my heart is bringing the sense of spirit, the sense of wisdom into our lives more, um, being more, um, Realizing the interconnection of life and yet also knowing that it starts with me. It starts with what I can do, how I can be um, more loving, more uh, supportive of others, more aware of the sense of community wherever I am. So that's what we've tried to do with our book, The Practical Visionary, and to help people navigate through the new energies that are coming in right now that are speeding everything up and making everyone feel like, oh my God, you know, what's going on today? But to me, there's hope. There's really a bigger vision that we can all be part of. Well, let's project ahead. Where do you see the future in the next 10, 20 years? Mm -hmm. As from a visionary point of view, how do you see the world? Mm -hmm. From Again, you like to look at it from both sides, the good mm -hmm. and the bad. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think there will continue to be challenges, for sure. But I'm actually pretty optimistic about our future together on this planet because I think people are waking up. It's taken some, you know, hurricanes and disasters and from nuclear disasters to weather disasters to wake people up. It's taken gun violence, extreme thing of children dying, to wake us up to maybe a more conscious and more um, intelligent way to deal with guns in our society, for instance. It's taken crises kind of to wake us up, and that to me is very encouraging. So I, I see that, the, you know, both in our personal lives, I've certainly been through my own personal crises <laughs> over the last few years in various ways, but also in our, in our life in society, in, our, in the bigger world, I see us moving in a more conscious way, just in my lifetime to see how, for instance, racial barriers are being broken down, gender barriers have broken down, you know, so many things have been really transforming, you know, from where things were when I was growing up to where they are today, and that encourages me. And I feel like life is moving so fast, you know, it's, they call it the Schumann frequency, the actual resonance of the earth is speeding up. That's why we all feel like everything's going so fast, everybody's so speedy. It isn't just technology. It's the actual scientific measurement of the frequency of the earth, the Schumann resonance. So to me, what's happening is the earth itself is going through a transformation. And we can all choose to be part of it, to go with the new energy, to bring heaven down to earth, to bring spirit into matter, to be more practical with our visions, more effective, or we can just, you know, try to, you know, close our eyes to things or keep being angry and keep blaming certain people, certain groups, certain institutions. I don't think that's an effective way to move ahead for the future, but in the next 10 years I would see us having much better environmental awareness and sustainable approaches in our companies and our government regulations and so on. I see us being creating a more peaceful society, learning conflict resolution work, dealing with mental health issues, so we don't have the kind of violence that our society, particularly this country, has. Um, I'm encouraged that we're moving in that direction. There are every problem you can think of, someone, somewhere, some group has created a solution. And that, to me, is very encouraging. I like to highlight the solutions. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure in Thank speaking you. with you. I've learned a lot. Thank you. And the, the most I've learned is basically that one should let go and be calm and be centered. Mm -hmm. And as everything is quickening around us, yes. it's very important to allow our natural innate energy mm -hmm. to shine forth mm -hmm. and to be. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for all your wisdom. Thank you. And from the art of conscious living, do take care of yourself and take care of others.